Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. Sloths today are represented by two genera, best identified by the number of fingers, two and three respectively. They are both arboreal animals, generally restricted to trees. Their metabolism is slow compared to most mammals, a trait they share with others in arthrons like armadillos and anteaters. Although both look similar, their resemblance is actually an extreme case of convergent evolution, with a common terrestrial ancestor around 35 million years ago, hinting at the sheer diversity of sloths in the past. Perhaps the most exciting example of sloth diversity were the ground sloths, with 80 genera going back at least to the Oligocene, although they don't appear to have exceeded a few hundred pounds until the Miocene. Some were omnivores, others specializing in just a few plants. Some, like Eremotherium, were the size of an elephant, with tropical and likely were as hairless as a modern rhino or elephant, while sloths of Patagonia, like Mylodon, were insulated by dense coats of fur. One lineage even had bone armor in their skin, underscoring their relationship to armadillos, and raising the question if this trait arose independently, may have partially been ancestral to Xenarthrans as a whole, or if there is something between which might predispose the evolution of this trait in Xenarthrans as a whole. The two modern genera of Earth come from only two of the sloth lineages. Once sloths are seen in their full context, the differences between the two modern sloths become much more evident. Two-fingered or two-toed sloths have a versatile diet and even dabble in omnivory, have very wide ranges, have even faster metabolisms, are nocturnal, and possess large fangs. Three-toed sloths have much more conservative metabolisms, limit their diet to a few types of plant, rarely leave their favorite tree with territories a tenth the size of their two-fingered cutters, and only leave their homes to defecate once a week or so. Though both types of sloth grow algae in their fur, the fur of three-fingered sloths is much more abundant. Grooves in their fur offer foundation to this algae, which offers camouflage as well as a nutrient supplement. Modern sloths are found exclusively in northern South America and into Central America, alongside the island pygmy sloth near Panama. Their evolutionary origins were in South America, though numerous genera have been identified in North America as part of the biological interchange. The first sloths introduced to Chimere, or at least the first to have widespread success, were semi-arboreal basal species brought during the South American harvest around 13 million years ago. Along with monkeys brought at the time, these would thrive in the vast and dense jungles which made up around 90% of the land in the extremely humid known world at the time. There may have been some larger taxa, although they were small and capable climbers. As titanosaurs returned to the known world and dramatically altered the floral composition of the region's forests, coupled with the trend toward more arid climate, most of these basal sloths perished around a million years after introduction. I say most, as a relic will be introduced later in this episode. The next harvest to bring sloths to Chimere was not from South America, but its northern counterpart eight million years ago. Although Northern and Southern America would not connect for another six million years, 
where the majority of the interchange took place, sloths are surprisingly proficient swimmers, enabling them to get an enormous head start on this interchange. In fact, they were among the few South American clades to have success in North America, a continent much colder and hit much less turmoil by the climate changes which defied the Pliocene leading up to the interchange. Adapting to North America this early undoubtedly aided their success when so many other South American clades diminished or went extinct once the two continents finally collided. These pioneers were the Mylodonts, belonging to the same clade as two-fingered sloths. Like their cousins, Mylodonts had flexible diets, including omnivory, along with a generally faster and more demanding metabolism. As many sloths take this from this harvest were placed in the open territories following a minor extinction event, Mylodonts didn't face a whole lot of competition. Most other animals in this harvest were better adapted for running, while Mylodonts were slow and protected by a substantial bone armor in their skin. As the competition ran circles around them, Mylodons thrived in place. They did most of their grazing at night, spending their days in simple burrows. They also had a secret defense not seen in the indigenous North American fauna that I will address later on. Thymobidistes, or a similar sloth, appears to have been collected in this harvest, and was especially successful in southern Arvel, which only recently arrived in the territory of the portal. Six million years ago, amidst the shifting continents as Arvel and Picardia continued toward Nikar, a volcanic release of phosphorus in the northern mountains of Nikar triggered a bloom of algae and magic which wiped out the fresh waters of the seritic wetlands and marine habitats of the Crescent. Mostly aquatic habitats were impacted, though most fresh waters of Nikar became toxic. Once the nutrient surplus diminished and the region recovered, a massive harvest occurred from the habitat on Earth with a similar climate. Late Miocene, South America. The flora and fauna brought during this harvest experienced such tremendous success that it would go on to stabilize the region and prevent necessary harvests for almost five million years. This was called the Anchored Period by Chimeran paleontologists. One of the greatest success stories during this harvest were the sloths. Largest of these brought at this time was a four-ton sloth believed to be closely related to the ancestor of such Pleistocene icons as Arimotherium and Megatherium. Megatheres are closer relatives of the three-toed sloths and may have similarly restricted diet and much slower metabolisms. These megatheres especially thrived in the grasslands of northern Nikar, although with their narrow snouts, they were mostly browsers of the mosaic forests scattered throughout the prairies, which enabled them to coexist alongside the grazing gomphotheres. They did face some competition from large Thescelosaurs, also vying for the browsing prairie niche, although these two lineages may have niche partitioned in other ways, perhaps which different types of trees they preferred, or what time of day they would feed. During the following 5 million years absent harvest, again called the Anchored Period, Megatheres would be the one of the most abundant large mammals in Nikar. In Arvel, a different clade of sloth grew large. Lustodon is a robust mylodont known from Earth's Pliocene and Pleistocene. Their largest males may have been between 3 and 4 tons, though the Miocene ancestor that was harvested for Chimere was around half this size. As mylodonts related to the North American lustodonts were already present, they had comparatively fast and demanding metabolisms compared to their megatheer companions, and they compensated by being bulk feeders on a wide range of plants, as well as scavenging any meat they stumbled upon. Like the North American taxa already present, these lustodonts were diggers and protected by dermal armor, although in both areas, the newly arrived South American lustodonts were more specialized. In the highlands of Arvel, these lustodonts continued to grow in size and complexity of their tunnels also increased. 
While the North American clade diversified into a wide range of niches, species, and habitats during these years, other mylodonts harvested at this time included several smaller taxa which thrived especially in the highland niches of both continents. Most of these smaller mylodonts were burrowers, although some became arboreal. The trees were also home to arboreal sloths, such as the two- and three-fingered chimeran sloths, still found in the crescent jungles today. Megathiers and their kin mostly established themselves in the grasslands and tropical forests of Nikar, although one perhaps unexpected habitat in which they thrived was the newly formed inland sea. Thalosochnus was a genus of marine sloth reaching its heyday at the time of harvest. Their exact phylogeny is unknown, but they are either descended from stem megathiers or belonging to a sister clade. Though the cooling climate of Earth would not only reduce the sea levels and eliminate many of the seagrass meadows on which they relied, the connection to North and South America also changed the ocean currents, which may have quickly cooled their habitat. In Chimere, Thallus Oaknus was brought to a warm world with the seagrass meadows spanning over half the territory of the Indian Ocean. Although these seagrass grazers did face some competition with sea cows and desmostelians, the slower metabolism of sloths allowed them to get larger and stronger on less food. Not much of an advantage in times of plenty, but they were able to hold their own. They needed to go ashore to rest, but there were so many small islands scattered throughout the meadows that sea cows being fully aquatic was not a substantial competitive advantage. A mylodont harvested at this time also had a semi-aquatic lifestyle, Ionalitherium. They weren't nearly as specialized for the aquatic lifestyle as Thalassochnus, but came to Chimera and had success in the wetlands and shallows of the seagrass meadows. They never became particularly diverse, although their herds were quite abundant in the freshwater, tropical habitats of the anchored period. Throughout this age, sloths became one of the most successful clade of large herbivorous mammals. Their comfort in water and a keen sense of smell facilitated a vast spread quite like the proboscideans, which is why they arrived and thrived in most islands as well as both continents. While many mammals, such as reindeer, wolves, and cats, are able to detect elements of ultraviolet light using their blue receptor cones, many birds can see into this visual spectrum with specialized clarity, and their prey all but glow against many backgrounds. This is an ability possessed by such predators as megaraptorans, cockatrices, and terror birds, helping them spot prey night and day. The Assembly believes terror birds of Earth could have used this ability as well, seeing into the ultraviolet spectrum which may be why several South American megafaunal groups, such as mylodont sloths and latopterns, have sweat which dampens their UV signature, acting as camouflage for this extreme end of the visual field. As mylodonts are primarily nocturnal, having this additional buffer enables them to feed without drawing attention, and return to their dens during the day when most megaraptorans, cockatrices, and terror birds are hunting. The anchored period came to an end around 1.5 million years ago, triggered by a minor yet widespread extinction event caused by the shift of the planet's axis, making the southern hemisphere in which the known world resides cooler and more arid. The subsequent harvest brought an influx of new fauna, introducing not only new competition but a host of diseases. Earth at the time was much cooler than Chimere, so many of these animals had substantial, competitive advantages in the unstable and cooler climate. This only went on to further destabilize the environment. Most of the South American ungulates that had been so successful during the Anchored Period suffered as the Predator Guild shifted from an emphasis on ambush hunters to cursorial predators, and the grasslands of both continents were struck the hardest. By the time the planet shifted back to roughly the position it is in today, and the climate recovered, most of the South American ungulates were either extinct or pushed to the fringes, with their places taken by a host of deer, antelope, and bovines. Sloths, however, were generally far less impacted. 
The highly adaptable Mylodonts appear to have seen no change in their population. If anything, they became more successful, no doubt aided by the fact that they could simply grow more fur and eat different food. The abundance of cursorial predators was no issue. Their defenses and strength were more than enough for even the smaller attacks that were generally fine, especially those with burrows. The burrowing Mylodonts in particular came out of this extinction exceptionally well, and even proliferated in their population and species diversity in the past million years or so. Megathir sloths, however, did not fare so well. By this time, they were extremely specialized in trees of the grassland which had suffered heavy losses in the cool and arid period. Most were endangered by the time of the harvest, and the introduction of new competition proved too much for them to handle. Introduced mammoths and native mastodons generally replaced them in Arvel's highlands, and it appears Nikari megathirs were reduced to a single species, which survived another million years, but was among the many casualties of the spread of housey grass appearing in the known world. Though the seagrass meadows diminished thanks to a drop in sea levels, perhaps surprisingly, this context greatly favored the sloths. As there was suddenly a lot less food, the lower caloric demands meant that they could support larger herds and therefore assert and defend this resource than the Desmostylians and Serenians, needing a lot more. By the time the climate recovered and the mesos returned in full force, it was the sloths which dominated this new world. Serenians and Desmostylians both still have a few species in appreciable abundance, but with nine taxa in the known world today, there are far more species of Thalassochnid than both Serenian and Desmostylian combined, and their populations vastly exceed those of the competition. In fact, the sloths are so common that the Inland Sea is often called the Sloth Sea. The most abundant of the large sloths belong to the genus Volgarochnus, the common or bear sloth. There are four or five living species, Red or Wojun, Arveloth and Picardian Black Sloths, Housie Lion Sloth, and the Nikari Mountain Sloth. It appears Vulgar Oakness evolved in Arvel during the Anchored Period and proliferated during the Tormoral at its conclusion. They are by far the most predatory genus, with the Lion Sloth of the Housie Prairie becoming almost exclusively carnivorous during the dry season, only supplementing with grass or ginkgo bark until the rains return. Normally, though, they are primarily herbivorous and only supplement with meat. Volcarochnus has the fastest metabolism of any sloth, demonstrating this with shocking bursts of speed up to 25 miles per hour. Maybe not that impressive considering bears can move 10 miles per hour faster, though seeing as these sloths have enormous muscles devoted to slow twitch endurance and power over speed, it's quite a lot quicker than they look like they should be able to move. Their slow yet powerful muscles are adapted to dig their burrows and move massive amounts of soil if they can make short work of whatever they catch. Unfortunately for Chimerians, these sloths are plenty quick enough to catch up to a person. Given their similarity to bears and hogs, the assembly generally refer to ground sloths as boar and sow for male and female. Bulgarochnus is highly analogous to bears, to the point that these aggressive and competitive omnivores appear to have competitively excluded a lot of the bears harvested during the Pleistocene. Common sloth sows will often spend their days in the trees, although these half-ton body weight prevents them from climbing too high, and some will dig burrows. They will often leave their cubs in trees while they forage, especially if they smell small predators in the area. Even babies are protected by a mesh of bony armor under their fur, but there are plenty of predators that would turn them into a satisfactory meal. Females generally live in loose troops of three to a dozen related animals, while males are almost always solitary. Boar, which in many species can weigh up to two tons, such as the largest black sloths, are far too large to climb. They dig burrows, although these dens are often quite simple structures. The claws of males tend to be wider, aiding in their digging, while females have narrower claws with hooked tips which aid in climbing. 
In addition to their formidable claws, vulgar oakness have two pairs of tusks which grow throughout the animal's life, sharpening each time the animal closes their jaws. These tusks are substantially larger in boar. Though they appear to have initially evolved for battles between boar over mating rights and female troops, this genus is well documented for using them to dispatch prey and fend off predators. Perhaps due to nutritional demands, greater size, or maybe their tusks are just better suited for the job, most acts of active predation are done by boars. Despite their armor, formidable claws, and self-sharpening tusks, even the largest bear sloths are prey to a predator which followed South American sloths through the portal. Terror birds. Firebacks, a species abundant in the forests of both continents, is the most common predator of bear sloths. While they can be a threat, a few firebacks are documented as specialists in bear sloth. There's only one way for a terror bird to reliably get around a sloth's armor and weaponry, which they rectify by latching onto their beaks and disemboweling. It's a gruesome process that I don't think YouTube will allow me to elaborate on, but terror birds have certainly earned their name. Big cats, cockatrices, phallacaleo, and megaraptorans all sometimes prey on bear sloths, but terror birds maintain this ancient rivalry. As previously stated, the Nikari Mountain Sloth is sometimes found to be outside the genus. They are the most anatomically distinct, seemingly having come to Nikar early in the Anchored Period and preluding the spread of their relatives. Females are also much more solitary, generally living alone. They are more strictly nocturnal than other species of vulgar oakness. This helps avoid Cockatrice and Megaraptoran, although they are the favored prey of Rohokundi terror birds and Thylacaleo. The den of a female mountain sloth, claimed by a Thacaleo, was featured in the second story of my first anthology, Fire in the Shadows. While aquatic mylodonts descended from animals like Ionalotherium didn't find nearly as much success as the Thalassocnids, they are still quite abundant in the wetlands, with a subspecies in Nikari's northern rainforests, the Soretic wetlands, and Arvel's lowland swamps. Their long legs, longest of any ground sloth, keep them above the waterline as they feed on a wide range of highly nutritious wetland vegetation. With a faster metabolism than thalassocnids, they must eat a whole lot more, although they aren't nearly as picky as their seagrass-specialized counterparts. The Arvelis species, called the Sakur or Hippo Sloth by the Tentarim Islanders, who are sometimes visited by them, is the second largest sloth in Chimere, with males sometimes reaching 6 tons, although most boar are 4 or 5 tons, while sow are 2 or 3 tons. This extreme sexual dimorphism is common among ground sloths. In smaller species like the Burrowing Hog Sloth, Males might be 10 to 20% larger than the average female. As taxa get larger, the size difference increases, consistent with a trend in biology called Wrench's Rule. The biggest difference in the largest sloth species, the Hukulgore, in which sows weigh between 4 and 6 tons, and bulls routinely double the mass, and the biggest ever recorded by the assembly was a boar estimated to weigh 14 tons. These are extreme bulk feeders in every sense of the word, preferring a blend of grass, fruit, deciduous leaves, and meat. Unlike bear sloths, Hukugo cannot truly run, although they still charge at 12 to 15 miles per hour in short bursts. Walking on the side of their feet may look ill-suited to carrying their enormity, but this actually puts the weight through the legs and stacking foot bones very efficiently. They may have large arms and muscular chests, but the width of their hips and legs is such that they, even the largest boar can stand and walk about without much trouble, although they rarely hold this stance for long. Hukogor do possess body hair, although it is so small and sparse that it must be examined closely to be seen, especially in their tropical and subtropical populations. Like other mylodonts, 
Hukulgor Sao live in small groups of related individuals, with the more de massive boar are solitary, often wandering far when in rut. Hukulgor are descended from the excavator specialist relatives of Lestodon. The tunnels of Hukulgor Sao can carve thousands of feet into their highland homes. Hukulgor are masterful excavators able to scoop hundred pounds of soil with each motion of their arm. The tunnels often dip to accumulate water so the interior stays dry, but the rest will intertwine with their neighbors or just go straight into the mountain. Sometimes they take over and maintain a relative's tunnel once she passes away, but often they will leave the tunnels in disarray. The deep soil output of these tunnels, especially when mixed with their dung, makes for a highly fertile soil outside the dens, which result in lush, grassy meadows surrounding the entrance. The Hukugor needs some of this grass for a healthy diet, but it also supports many deer and other animals, needing some grass in an otherwise gymnosperm-dominated habitat. Males will often dig rudimentary burrows to laze away their day during the dry season, but once they begin bulking up to rut, they will spend most of their time wandering and digging tunnels large enough simply isn't worthwhile. They are partially driven by scent, seeking out females in their season, but they will also emit infrasonic calls with the hopes that the receptive sows will reply. Hukugo pregnancy lasts around a year and a half, and they often wait a year before mating again, so their cub will have almost three years of attention. So there's no guarantee that a wandering boar will meet eligible females, even if he finds a den. If there's another boar present, it may come to blows. Given their sheer enormity, along with claws and tusks, a fight between Hukugor can easily be lethal to both. Because of this, there's a lot more posturing and ritual to frighten away a lesser opponent than is reported in the much more violent common sloth. If these 12-ton boar do collide, they will lay waste the foliage, and the loser will often sustain such injury that he will be easy prey for a zentar, drawn to the sounds of conflict. The claws of Hukogor may be adapted for digging, but they are still formidable offensive weapons, and their strength in their chest and arms is staggering. They have been recorded to topple and kill Drenduga, Zentar, and even subadult titanosaurs in a brawl. Like bear sloths, their tusks are enormous and self-sharpening. The osteoderms on their back and hip are not only large, up to 6 inches, with smaller bones scattered throughout as reinforcement, they are also fat in extremely thick hide. Though some Zentar specialize in Hugogor and can kill even the largest boar, using large claws to pierce the few weak points in Hugogor armor, such as under the jaws and in the armpits, for the most part these enormous sloths have little to fear, especially in the northern highland forests, where Zentar are less abundant, yet their own favorite food is more common. Hugogor have a reputation for belligerence and even homicidal tendencies, but this is largely due to the context of their interactions with Chimerans. Males especially require a tremendous amount of food, and settlements that do not take care to cover their scent of their gardens and pastures are a reliable lure to these behemoths. Any resistance will be met with half-hearted retaliation, but a half-hearted backhand from a Hukogor can easily kill a warhorse. If they are injured in efforts to chase them off, then the rampage might begin, and entire towns can be laid to ruin. Aggression from sows, which account for far more Chimeran fatalities, are driven by territorial protection of their tunnels, often while the offspring are inside. Carcasses claimed by Hugalor are also viciously defended. There are also cases of both sexes being startled, and since they cannot reliably run away, Fighting is often the only recourse of a Hukogor. All this to say, while common sloths earn their malicious reputation, well known to going man-eater or kill for the sake of it, Hukogor are much less aggressive, although their attacks are far more devastating. An angry common sloth can rip open a man's chest or tear off a door. A rampaging Hukogor can destroy the walls surrounding a town and plow through half of the village storehouse, 
making them a threat to the entire settlement. Before the arrival of the first children, Hukogo ranged from Nikar, Northern Arvel, Kajar, and down to Picardia. It is assumed that they reached Picardia by island hopping during the low sea levels at the end of the anchored period, although they can swim for several days without stopping, so it's entirely possible that they made the voyage before, though a majority likely occurred 1.5 million years ago, especially if their food space was strained during this period. Ever since the first children conquered the Kadarath Peninsula and rendered the population extinct, the Picardian and Arveleth Hukulgore have been completely isolated. Picardian Hukulgore tend to be a bit smaller on average and have more fat and visible fur to insulate them in this temperate climate. Overall, they are still considered the same species, especially since the Arveleth boar sometimes make the voyage and integrate without issue. Like proboscideans, Hukulgore and common sloths have established island populations in the Kaleen Sea, especially during times of low sea levels, such as 1.5 million years ago, and these populations have since become isolated. Kalren, for example, has a species of Hukulgore that weigh less than a ton, vying for the small species of local Paleoloxodon as the biggest animal of this large island. Some are even smaller, often correlating with island size. Since sloths generally were introduced later in the Miocene, and fewer periods of low sea level occurred in their tenure, there are not nearly as many islands having species of dwarf mylodont as those with populations of dwarf protoacidians. Although Volgarokness got the name Common Sloth, there are smaller mylodonts more deserving of this title given their greater population. Hog sloth, for example, have extremely wide range and are highly abundant. Both sexes dig complex tunnels. Much like those of Hukor, these dens routinely rotate the soil, bringing nutrients to the surface and promoting floral biodiversity. While hog sloths are reviled for their damage to crops, many people who live in farm and titan gardens owe their ability to have crop-yielding soil to the very sloths that they despise. The Red River Sloth is a relative of hog sloths common in the wetlands and lowland forests. They dig deep and complex burrows, often into banks that they can reach through the water. Despite being so tied to water, they are not an aquatic or even semi-aquatic species as they forage on land and only use water for safety. Like Hukulgore, they have a reputation for ferocity, which is largely misplaced. They have extreme aggression and territorial near the entrance of their burrows, and since this is the same rivers in which many locals drink, this does lead to a lot of confrontations, although they are not inherently aggressive and will flee while foraging or take to their dens if attacked on land, relying more on their dermal armor and only attacking if cornered again unless they are near their den. Mylodonts and Thalassocnids make up a vast majority of sloths in Chimera, although there are a few others, often on the fringes of the known world. There are two- and three-fingered sloths still found in the crescent jungles and seretic wetlands, though this is the only habitat in which they are found. Though not of any modern Earth species, given that they have been in the same habitat for six million years, they lead similar lives or in the same genera. Though restricted in range, they are not considered endangered. A mysterious clade of arboreal sloth is found in Picardia, the Simiomorphs. As their name suggests, these sloths are built quite like great apes and gibbons. They have a highly active metabolism, enabling them to move through trees with speed and precision. Their origins are unknown, with most arguing for a first South American harvest, while others think that they were harvested at the same time as most sloths. They are genetically related to two-toed sloths, complete with fangs and varied diets, although the exact relationship is unclear, especially considering they have four claws on each hand. Some think that they evolved on Earth and thrived in Chimere, while others believe that they arrived, similar to two-toed sloth, and derived after arrival. Considering how poor the fossil record is, especially in the rainforest, it is generally assumed that this mystery will remain unsolved, as any ancestors of Earth almost certainly left no trace we will ever find. 
While the vast majority of sloths in Chimere come from the late Miocene of North and South America, there is one species described by the assembly which is presumed to be a Skeletothere mylodontoid from the jungle harvest 13 million years ago. A reclusive animal, the cougar sloth so named for their coloration and body shape. Females are small enough to spend most of their time in trees. Males, being notably larger, are more terrestrial, although they are capable imers and often sleep in lower branches. This habitat is isolated from the rest of the known world by a vast mountain range, and it is beyond the territory of the portal. As such, in a bit of a lost world hearkening back to Chimere after the dynastic extinction and before the arrival of the Titans. Thanks to a constant storm, it is a lush habitat, although these highlands are uneven and not well suited to support many large animals. With males weighing as much as 300 pounds, they are still one of the largest animals in this habitat. A recently discovered species that is quite similar to the simiomorphs was found in these jungles as well. Genetic studies comparing them and the cougar sloth found that these two are closer related to each other than any other sloths in Chimere. If this study is replicated and verified, it would further support the suggestion that simiomorphs come from the first South American Miocene harvest. On the other side of the map, the highlands of Arvel have a relic of their own. The reaper sloth is the last of the giant megatheres. They have a more versatile diet than other megatheres, no doubt a key to their survival. They will feed on a range of trees found in the highlands. They are only found in the western reaches of the highlands before it fades into a vast desert, perhaps due to the introduction of Paleoloxodon, which also pushed the last mastodon to the region to endangerment and then ultimately extinction. Despite their formidable name and appearance, reaper sloths are timid creatures that rarely use their half-meter claws outside of reaching for branches. These sloths are presumed to be endangered, although the region is poorly explored and they be, may have greater abundance in the higher elevations and valleys deeper inland. Neocnus is the only sloth to survive from the most recent harvest, that which was interrupted by the first children. While the portal mostly focused its efforts on Kajar, which had just undergone a cull of its megafauna by the invading peoples, a few places, like the Kentering Islands, had new species introduced as well. Neocnus, the monkey sloth, has become quite successful in a habitat quite analogous to its native Caribbean islands. Overall, sloths remain an extremely successful and versatile clade in Chimere, being so abundant and diverse that Chimerans view their rarity on Earth just as strange as they see birds as our only surviving dinosaurs. Cheers to Gage for sponsoring this episode! Much like the Firebird episode Gage sponsored back in September, this one ran a lot longer than I intended, but sloths are so important and successful in Chimera's ecosystem that I shouldn't be surprised I had a lot to say. Even so, there was so much that I wasn't able to cover, leaving plenty for future episodes on harvests, biomes, and species. Back in October of 2021, I featured a sloth episode. Nothing in that is wrong aside from some of the art, for example I based the Hukagor way too much on a Remotherium, since it was the best example of a sloth I had in that size class, but this episode was a much greater opportunity to expand upon in more robust format, and I'm very thankful to Gage for supporting that effort. Thank you so much to my Patreon patrons for your support. Helps make sure I have plenty of time for recording and illustrations. The thing I've been working on is a map of the known world to hang on my wall. By the time this airs, the map may already be done, which would be super exciting. Thank you all so much for watching. Even if you're not able to join on Patreon, watching episodes is a great way to support. I'm closing in on 10,000 YouTube subscribers, which is a super exciting milestone. I'm so glad so many of y'all enjoy this project. The next few episodes will be going into focus on single species that I'm excited to unpack, and we will be closing the year 2023 with an episode, 
following a totally new structure, which I expect fans of the Walking With series are going to recognize and get a kick out of. Until next time, stay fantastic, everyone. Cheers, folks!